Thanks, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, we'll go ahead and get started since there was a little bit of a delay. Um, of course, I have to thank the funding agencies and all my collaborators, because um, everyone knows that treatment research and our imaging research takes a village for sure. And of course, my lab and patients. Um, as we go through the next 45 minutes or so, I want to hit on a few things, um, namely some of the perpetuating myths around AAC and aphasia, and then introduce the theoretical framework that I've used to kind of frame how I approach AAC and aphasia um, in terms of tackling communication and language recovery. Then I'll take you through a feasibility study um, that we did looking at using AAC to simulate language recovery. And then kind of what I'm now in future directions. Um, before we get going, I need to make a caveat that when I'm talking about AAC, I'm speaking pretty globally here. And we really have to think about interface design um, because interface design itself affects how people with aphasia speak, how they interact and so forth. So just to give you a little flavor of the major kinds of displays with the, the grid, the traditional grid here, and then the visual scenes displays here. I have just a quick video to kind of orient us all to the different interfaces. The first one is grid, where you press the button. Okay. Feelings, love, all words list, to the category plants, and then flowers, change it to flowers, you go to all forms and press flowers, and then you can press the speak button. I love flowers. So as you can see, this interface has a lot of steps to say those simple three words. The next is the visual scene display, scene display which I will go to my story, which is me in a flower garden, and I have pre-programmed the sentence, I love flowers, so I can point to it and use it as an aid, or I again can press the speak button. I love flowers. Okay, so those are the two main types. And then there's this newer hybrid type that kind of combines the two. And um, we don't really have much evidence at, at all for this interface type. So as we go forward today, keep in mind that there are different interface designs and that I'm kind of ignoring that fact as we go forward, but it's something to always think about. So as we get started, the first myth I think is still pretty persistent um, is that AAC interferes with spoken language. And then this kind of perpetuates through and creates other myths, um, namely that AAC is something that you do after there's a plateau in restorative treatment, or maybe only if they're really severe in the acute stages. Um, and that, that leads into the idea that AAC and language recovery are mutually exclusive. Um, and then somewhere in there is the idea, if you look at most of the studies out there, most of the people that have AAC studies um, subjects are people with broken aphasia. And so um, I just kind of want to dispel those as we go through and we'll kind of come back to them at the end and hopefully I've achieved that goal. Um, and then you all hold up your no signs for those. So. Um, recently, Sarah Wallace and Chrissy Weisling and I published a, a viewpoint in AJSLP kind of addressing some of these myths and just giving basically our opinion of how we can resituate, recontextualize AAC in the rehab spectrum, but it's grounded in the evidence. Um, and I'm going to talk about the last two points here um, a little bit as we get started today. So using AAC to enhance natural abilities and then the idea of an earlier introduction of AAC. So that fear that language, the AAC interferes with language recovery um, comes from the idea of learned on out and constraint-induced aphasia therapy, um, which of course comes from the, the motor research that when you have a stroke, you have there's a physiological reason why you can't speak that, um, things, you know, there's swelling, bleeding, you know, all the above that's, you know, causing tissue death and the patient can't talk. And that leads to unsuccessful spoken communication that's negatively reinforced. But then the idea is that reinforcement creates this lack of motivation to speak, and then you have learned non-use. 
And the idea is that this can happen if you give them AAC as well. Um, it's kind of like this study that just came out this week um, where they were looking at casting and the effect of connectivity in the brain when they cast an arm and that functional disconnection begins literally within hours of the casting up to days, but that when the cast is removed, that things can sort of normalize again. So I'd like to put out there that we don't want to think of AAC as a cast, because I think depending on how we implement AAC, it could. Um, and I hope the message that you hear from me today is that it's really not does AAC create learn on use, it's how you implement AAC matter. Um, and so we don't have this phenomena of the cast um, here. So I just thought I would bring that up. So because of this fear of learn non use and you know people just want to talk again, it, it is something that's ingrained in us. We are hardwired to communicate. That's why people have accidents when they're texting and they're driving because we are more wired to communicate. Um, there is some interesting data um, by Roberta Elman. She gave a survey to a large number of people, I forget how large it was, but it was uh, a national survey. And 50% of caregivers reported receiving education about AAC during the first three months of recovery. So I will put the qualifier out there that I understand that oftentimes we tell patients and families things early on and they don't recall them. Um, and you, you kind of have to keep repeating things. So maybe let's say 80% were told about it, but it didn't hit home. So that's the message I, I take from that. But maybe even more powerful is the ASHA NOMS data, where um, in 2014, 862 post-acute patients, of those, only 13% received AAC. However, if you take out the people with concomitant apraxia speech, that shriveled down to 2%. Um, so this creates problems, you know, for a wide variety of reasons. I think that when we are not AAC early on, we're waiting for things to plateau, if you will, that we're sending a message. And um, this is kind of rooted in experience for me when I was a CF. I remember having a patient, her name was Fran. Um, I did this very thing. I, you know, did all I could to restore, 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 restore. And then when we had a few visits left and I knew I wasn't gonna get any more extensions, I started throwing AAC at her and she literally got mad at me. She felt like I was giving up on her. And I think that's the message that we're sending people if we don't give them a way to communicate because it signals, I give up on you. So just food for thought. It seems like when I give this analogy to people with a picture like this one, where you see a man with a quad cane, probably the PT, maybe a PTA or his daughter or someone with the wheelchair behind him, you know, what we see is that the physical therapist doesn't wait for people to be able to independently walk before they give them equipment to help them move around in their environment. And so, you know, my question is then why do we wait? Why should we wait till people fully recover? in order for them to communicate. And it's really kind of a powerful analogy if you think about it. You know, we're not, we're not going to let people just sit in their bed until they can walk. So why are we gonna wait for them to be able to have their language system back before they can communicate again? It's kind of my analogy. So the idea is, you know, they shouldn't have to wait instead maybe we should consider teaching them how to use these strategies to compensate for the anomic events they're going to have probably for the rest of their life for a good portion of them and then teach them how to self-cue spoken language with that AAC whenever it's possible. So just some things to think about from that paper. However, learn non use is real. And another, another reason to think about early um, intervention, early AAC intervention is to prevent this ward talk that happens. Pretty powerful study from our Australian colleagues um, that they basically set up video cameras in patient rooms and of stroke patients with and without aphasia. And they 
transcribed the interactions between the nurses and between them and the patients. And what they noticed is that when they were in Asia, they used um, closed questions, you know, yes or no. They kind of restricted the conversation to pain, food, medicine, that sort of thing. Um, didn't have a lot of communicative strategies to help them repair or co-construct messages. And then really kind of dominating the conversational floor. And so, you know, on top of that, that this is another reason to get AAC in there because when we're not working with them, they have no way to communicate. And I think this points to the fact that, you know, unwittingly people can facilitate learn non-use when AAC isn't there. So I don't think we really think about it that way, that learn non-use can happen without AAC there. Um, so partner training is a big way to get over that hurdle, right? To get people um, experience and learning how to communicate with people who have aphasia. Um, and this is super work, but the issue is their paid carers have high turnover, family's not always around. So we have to have kind of the full spectrum of, of care here. So we've all experienced working with people with aphasia and they do a lot of things just naturally that self-cue. They will, um, you know, finger write in the air. Some of them will write on a, a pad, draw. We teach them things. There's some literature out there that shows that these natural AAC type strategies do indeed facilitate word retrieval. Um, and they're successful at doing this. And so as I was putting together some of my earlier work, I was looking more at interface design, how that affected people's language. Um, I started getting interested in figuring out how can I kind of I stomp out this myth that AAC is going to get in the way of, of language, um, spoken language recovery. And kind of at the same time, well, kind of, I should have said this earlier, but I had been involved in a couple of constraint-induced aphasia therapy studies, which as an AAC person was really hard for me to um, administer that sort of treatment, but really bringing those two worlds together helped me kind of piece together my journey to produce data that kind of flies in the face of some of these myths. So I started digging through the literature a little bit more and re-looking at articles that I had looked at years ago. What I noticed in some of these small end studies with AAC and aphasia, which were largely people with Broca's aphasia, that on top of improving their communication skills, they were reporting decreased aphasia severity with you know, lower, um, aphasia quotients on the Western aphasia battery, and that their linguistic form was improving, not necessarily in spoken, but in terms of that video I showed you where they were sequencing icons together, they were able to increase linguistic form. So there's some evidence there to say, hey, we can use AAC to actually enhance spoken language, because we're seeing decreases in aphasia severity, and the fact that they can increase their linguistic form. Um, but then, you know, at the same time I was doing this work where we were basically putting in different types of interlines in front of people. There's a couple of case, collective case series where we had them talking with personal pictures, without personal pictures, with text, without text, um, all these different variations. And we did a variety of communicative um, evaluations. But one thing that we did notice is that while we were doing this work, that 70% of what we call the expressive modality units, whether there's drawn, written, um, using the pictures, the text box, and then spoken, of all, all the expressive modality inscribed across these two studies, that 70% of what people attempted was spoken. So this tells us that at least you know, exposure to AAC in and of itself doesn't make people stop talking. People want to talk first. And as I'm continuing with the constraint-induced aphasia work that's still going on at the same time here, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, how can we put this together? And then um, 
my AAC colleagues, Kathy Binger and Jennifer Kent Walsh, have this acronym TIPS that they use with the kids they work with, the technology, instruction, and personalization. And so the idea is that, you know, we got to, I understand more about how to design the interface to create success, um, but that instruction is critical. So that, that was kind of the point that we were missing along the way. So what does instruction look like for AAC to promote language recovery? And so this was what I was trying to, you know, put together into a systematic way, if you will. So as I was merging the worlds of neuroplasticity and AAC, which you don't often see together at this time, some of the main points of neuroplasticity kind of struck out to me. And this isn't, you know, I don't need to review this for this audience, but, you know, just thinking about the, the fact that the brain responds to the activities that you give to it, right? And the idea that, oh, I skipped, here we go. And the idea that neuroplasticity can also mean impairment, thinking of that analogy of putting the cast on. And taking it one step further, that in order for neurons to form these beneficial connections, they have to be properly stimulated. And really, really that's been missing in AAC interventions to date, is that we largely give them a book or a device, and we don't tell them not to talk, but we don't typically encourage them to talk with it necessarily and then when they can't then they go to the book so you're kind of separating this really important act of speaking or at least trying to speak um, with the act of going to someplace in the book or um, drawing or navigating through a device whatever the case might be and then the, um, made me think of something that is definitely not new to our field but intersystemic reorganization and that idea that you know if we pair existing performance acts with new performance acts that you know we can create a novel performance act and to me this ties together beautifully with the principles of neuroplasticity and so the key here for me was thinking okay we need to have people with aphasia do what we've been seeing them do just naturally, air writing, writing things down. We need to take that and teach them how to do it with technology, which is not always um, easy or normal. I think as um, our population um, continues to age out and we get people who were, you know, born with technology in their hands, that maybe that becomes more commonplace. Um, but for a lot of people, using a device to communicate is really um, unusual and also to think about the fact that um, just in the last decade or so the mobile technology boom what that's done for stroke um, in the study I'm going to talk about here we use this giant VMAX and um, the study is not that old but we use this giant VMAX that weighs you know it's really made to be mounted on a wheelchair for someone who has ALS and they're not going to be carrying it that's not good for someone who has hemorrhage excuse me, hemiparesis and has balance issues anyhow. So um, iPads, iPad minis have been really great, I think, for increasing acceptance. And so um, now we have the issue of figuring out how to make it work for them when they get it. So that's what we tried to do in this feasibility study, where um, basically the idea was, let's see if we can do this. Can we develop an AAC intervention that brings in those principles of neuroplasticity and intersystemic um, reorganization them. and with what we've seen them do with natural communication, drawing and writing, and do that in a high-tech way. And then if we can do that, can we see evidence of AAC-induced changes in brain activation? Um, so uh, we went. And from here, we had a pre-post treatment design with a control group, um, six people in each group. They, we, we tried to match them by aphasia type. So doing what 
I wish people would stop doing, and that was targeting people with Broca's aphasia. But it was one of those spells where every person with aphasia I was getting had fluent aphasia. So I said, okay, we'll just enroll them. Let's see what happens. Um, so I'll show you the patients in just a second. So we tried to keep the two groups balanced so that one didn't have all Broca's, the other had all anomic and so forth. Um, they would come in and they would get some neuroimaging and some behavioral testing that I'll talk about. And then from there, they would be randomized into these groups where they went into a four week intervention. And then afterwards, they had post treatment assessment and um, neuroimaging. So we didn't have multiple pains or anything, but I didn't have a huge budget um, given that it was um, a training grant and it had treatment and neuroimaging involved. Um, so this was our group. Here are our participants. You can see they were all very chronic. Um, most of them had at least um, some college education. We have global to anomic to conduction. Um, we can come back and look at this if, if you want to, but we had a um, pretty you know, wide variety of different types. So that was, that was nice to see. Um, and then from here, before they went into the treatment, they had some discourse testing where they retold two personal narratives using the device to a listener, um, and it was my colleague Jennifer Van Ness. And we just randomly assigned their stories to be with AAC or without AAC. And then the Western aphasia battery, we gave a few other tests, but this was the, the main outcome here. Then in the scanner, we administered the a verb task where when they were presented with a noun, they had to respond with either saying the verbs. So if they heard the word cookie, they had to say the, you know, bake, eat, things that you do with the noun, or just think about the verbs or either repeat the noun that they heard, cookie, cookie, cookie. Um, and we use this um, as far as acquisition approach so that they could hear the stimuli when the scanner was quiet and um, didn't have that to deal with. And in this study, we compared the overt verb generation to the overt semantics and kind of removed the motor piece. For the usual care, um, I wanted to simulate what would be reasonably possible in an outpatient center where they might get treatment three times a week, an hour a day for four weeks. Um, I had an SLP who came in and, and she, I gave her the Western aphasia battery and she kind of developed a treatment plan for these patients. And the way she described it was like a, a Shulian approach. And um, I had her keep track of the types of tasks and everything and the goals that she had with people, but very much an impairment language system focus. For the AAC treatment, um, they had the same frequency and intensity of intervention as the usual care. Um, and there were four steps and it was, had a multi-modality focus that we'll go over here. And I do wanna say full disclosure that the, um, the story that they retold in the discourse with the AAC um, was the story we used in treatment. So we can talk about that in a little bit too. But for the AAC queuing system, the first step was really familiarization to help them become operationally competent, um, whereas the other steps help them become more strategic um, and linguistically competent. So just identifying where the pictures were, where the text boxes were, where the speak buttons were, and what they each did. Um, for the person with Wernicke's aphasia, this, this took longer than it did for someone with Broca's aphasia. Um, but it was an important part of them understanding um, how to use the interface. And I will say too, that we took away navigation. They didn't have to go find things. When they came in, their story was up. And then for step two, we call it segmented story elements, where we have basically, it's a, I know it's a little bit, these are, this is my son's first birthday. So if this were be to my mom, she would be talking about her grandson's first birthday. And what we do here is we identify the, the main words like grandma, um, Logan, first birthday. 
and then we have them try to say it, point to the word grandson. And so this is not sentence level yet. This is just each word and try to say it again, then point to the grandson in the picture and then try to say it again. And then they press the speak button, which says it for them, and then they try to say it again. So the idea is that you're getting them to always associate referencing the device, whether it's having the device speak, pointing to the text, or pointing to the picture, that you're getting them to pair that with attempting to say it. And it's okay if they can't say it, but the idea is if you're attempting to say something and you're recruiting, those areas um, of the brain, maybe the paralegional areas um, that are recruited um, after stroke um, to help them say those words. And then once you've done that word by word by word, and for here, we typically only do like the nouns and verbs. We don't do all the articles at this point. Then we go to guided practice and self-analysis. Um, oh, this is just guided practice. The self-analysis is the next step. Um, so for here, you can see the figure changes a little bit. So first, you have kind of in the middle, try to say it. And, and then after they try to say it, and they, if, they have, if they're successful, they move on. If they struggle, then they have the option of pointing to the words, pressing the speak button, pointing to the pictures, um, whatever one is going to be the most helpful to them. And so the whole idea is, again, trying to say it first, and then as they point to it, they've learned back here to try to say it as they're interacting with the device. And then the self-analysis part, which is step four, is where we have uh, someone that they're relatively familiar with, but they don't really know they've seen them in the lab or the clinic, and they come in and they share their story with them, and we record it. And then we sit down with them and we have them review it with us. So we, we go over it, we point out when they tried to say it, when they made eye contact, because a lot of what we're looking at too is making sure they're not just staring at the device, that they're, it's a lot of meta linguistics involved, having them make eye contact, um, having them listen to their partner and not just dominate the conversational floor. And so we point out all the things they did well, and then we point out some things they can work on. And then we rewind it, we go back, and then the patient points to either the smiley face or the sad face if they see something they did well or something that they need to work on. And typically they only see what they need to work on. So we really make them learn how to identify what they're doing well. So this is kind of the, the heart of the intervention. So what did we find? All right, so this first, this slide talks about how their use of AAC strategies changed. And just to orient you to, um, up here, you've got their WAB scores, which we'll come to in a minute. You've got their retail with the device, their retail without the device. Um, and I'll kind of highlight some things. So what we noticed in terms of expressive modality units, so whether, they were speaking, drawing, gesturing, um, pointing to pictures, pointing to um, speaking to speak buttons or pointing to text boxes. I mean, we had three cameras in this room. So we had a camera on the dyad, a camera pointed down at the table, and then a camera behind them so we can capture the screen. So there was a lot to transcribe here and do reliability on. So what we noticed was that compared to the eight, AC group, the usual care group, had an increase in spoken expressive modality unit. And when we first saw this, we were a little worried, but you'll find out in a minute why I wasn't so worried. Um, what we also noticed is that um, there was a large effect size for people who received AAC intervention to learn how to use the photographs in a communicative way, not just random pointing, but to actually communicate an intent. Um, that, and then the other group really didn't improve um, on that skill at all. So in going to, oh yes, big, big find here, the speak button. So even the AAC group who 
I, as I just showed you, we expressly taught them how to use that if they needed to. Nobody in either group used the speak button. And to me, if there's any data point that says, look, AAC doesn't interfere with spoken language, it's this one. Because especially those in the AAC group were taught and they had to practice, but they didn't. Um, so there's that. And then when they went, came down here and retold the story without the device, so they got to look at the device, the story to kind of remember what the story was while we were waiting on the listener to come. And then we removed the device and they had to share the story. Here we noticed that only the AAC, the AAC group had an increased use of spoken um, language as well as gestures when compared to the usual care group. Um, the AAC group actually decreased their use of writing compared to the usual care group. So that's what they were doing with um, their different modalities. So the next table is kind of oriented the same way. It's the same table, but I'm gonna point out uh, the discourse analyses that we did. Um, so if you look up here, first at the WAB AQ, you can see that both groups increased. So this has changed. Um, and there was a small effect in favor of the AAC group. Um, and, you know, I'm not here to say that AA, we should replace traditional care with AAC. I just think, imagine if you combine the two, and you combine traditional restorative with AAC, that the magnitude increase that you could get there. Um, and then go ahead and look at what they did with the discourse. So remember, the AAC group actually spoke less after treatment than the usual care. But if you look, the AAC group um, had much higher increase in counted words, more CIUs. They were a little, little slower, but I would expect that if they're using a device. Um, fewer mazes and then and the T units compared to usual care. And this really held in the um, the condition without the device too, that we saw um, the counted words, the, the, you know, and the T units went way up as well. Um, so, you know, I will say that this, just to be transparent, that this is the story that the AAC group did practice this on. So on forward, we've added additional stories so that we have a probe story and the treatment story. Um, so just to be transparent in that. So, but we did get some effects in um, the condition without the device too. So what did we see in the brain? We saw um, some changes in language lateralization. Well, not really lateralization, but you saw pre-treatment in the blue. You can see that both groups were um, right lateralized for that verb pass, moving leftward to both be bilateral. Um, and this was a significant difference pre-treatment. So it looks that, and actually this change, the usual care group had a small effect for a bigger change for that leftward shift compared to the AAC group. But still, I'm um, exciting to see that the AAC group also shifted leftward on that index. And then looking at responders, we looked at people who Im improved by by greater than the standard error of measure on at least three of the spoken language dependent measures. Um, and here's what we found is that five of the six patients in the AAC group were responders and that um, two of, of the patients in the usual care group were responders. I do wanna point out that um, in the AAC group, people with fluent and non-fluent aphasia from the responders they produced more counter words overall, but those with non-fluent aphasia, they tended to increase their CIUs and T units, whereas the people with the fluent aphasias tended to decrease their mazes, um, and that, that was where their big change was. So they all had more counted words, and so this is where the intervention might be tailored differently to help capitalize on this, that you see an increase in T units and non-fluent, non but then fewer mazes. Um, and so forth with our fluent patients. So we can come back to that more. Then what we did is that given the nature of the visual, um, the visual nature of the AEC intervention, the photographs and the text, we wanted to examine pre to post treatment changes 
and activation intensity um, during the verb generation task here. So we looked at three bilateral um, regions of interest dedicated to the ventral visual stream that support visual processing. And here's what we found. So both groups had increased activation intensity in the left fusiform gyrus, which is not surprising because you use text in both interventions, but there was um, a large effect for the AAC group having more uh, of an increase. And then when you look across bilaterally across the other ROIs, you see that the AAC group increased activation intensity, whereas the usual care group decrease activation intensity. And so the clinical implications are that instruction is crucial, that if you harness the, the principles of neuroplasticity and you think about intersystemic reorganization and what that means, that if you, if you pull those together and you teach people with aphasia how to use technology the same way they're naturally using writing or drawing, then we can and get changes in spoken language. Um, also important to consider that a decrease in CMUs or just spoken language in general does not necessarily mean that the language functions decrease and we have to think about the quality of that language output, which is what we saw is that increased quality in what they were saving, saying even though it was reduced. So the bottom line here really is that uh, AAC can use as a dual, dual purpose tool that compensates for both deficits while augmenting language recovery. And then maybe there's a unique mechanism. You know, we demonstrated that we could tap the language network. Um, looking at Shelby Sandberg's work, that the visual network um, in people with aphasia um, is, in her study anyways, is tipped as the same as healthy controls. Um, so tapping into that visual network. And the, also, the other thing that's probably going on here is um, tapping into more domain general networks, like the multiple demand network, where maybe um, this multiple demand network, which is really kind of brought in to help with math, arithmetic, other cognitive processes, maybe it's being brought in as sort of a backup to help improve these, these language tasks. Um, so this is, these are things we want to explore as we're going forward. And in our current study, we call NAIL, um, we have three aims. And basically, we're, we're kind of repeating what we did in this feasibility study on a larger scale. And we've kind of um, modified a few things based on what we've learned. So we want to, again, just document the effect of the AAC intervention. We want to evaluate the underlying changes in functional and structural neuroanatomy. So we've added some DTI as well. And then uh, begin to look at treatment responder subgroups a little more closely with some of, the, some of those networks that I mentioned to see if we can do some predicting. So here's our setup. It's a switching replications design so that when people come in after assessment, they are, you know, they're randomly um, assigned to an immediate treatment or a delayed treatment group. So everybody gets treatment, it's just whether or not it's immediate. And so um, these actually are flipped. I don't know why <laughs> I keep forgetting to change that, but we do AAC programming and then there's two assessments back to back, behavioral and neuroimaging. And we've added a few behavioral measures I can talk about. Um, and then either they go into treatment or they wait for six weeks and then there's another assessment and then Either they go to treatment or they're wait again, then there's a fourth assessment. Um, we've enrolled 10, we completed five, COVID-19 stopped us in our tracks. Um, so we have three postponed. One I lost in the sixth week of a six week treatment. Um, and we did have one patient pass away um, during the study, not because of the study. Um, we did increase the treatment from four to six weeks, um, just looking at some of the DTI evidence out there and looking at how much time do we need to document learning um, and see changes in the white matter pathways. Um, we've added story practice effects so that we're alternating stories um, and you know having to basically working on generalization and so then we also have a built-in probe story. We have kind of two pathways 
So now we have a pathway, um, if they're milder, we kind of modify the steps a certain way to help people who are more anomic, more conduction, milder aphasia. And then those with, you know, Wernicke's, um, global aphasia, and then Broca's kind of falls kind of in between there, but we've tweaked the steps so that it can better accommodate the people. And this was just based on what we would have done in the previous study, but we couldn't do because for treatment fidelity, we didn't want to change midstream. And we've also added a picture description task using a continuous scan paradigm that I'm really excited about. And we use their personal pictures in the scanner. Uh, we added resting states and BTI, as I mentioned. So stay tuned, um, trying to figure out what we're gonna do right now with everything that's going on. Um, but hopefully you've got your no signs up and I've at least convinced you um, that there's reason to pause and to think, maybe think a little differently about how you might use AAC with people who have aphasia. And thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much. I'll switch to code. There we go. Speaker view. There we go. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. Uh, thanks for a great talk. So um, I have uh, started uh, adding some questions to uh, to kick things off. Um, the, the first one is a devil's advocate question. So I was wondering in your in the study that you presented. Um, you, you pointed out, for example, the the use the the non-use of the speak button, right? And I did wonder, looking at that in the study, you really seem to be using AAC as a as a treatment device, right? As a way to to as a training device, and that is that seems to me different from how an AAC is typically used in daily communication when it's actually when it it, it is typically used to replace another type of communication, right? So I was really wondering whether, um, whether that uh, generalizes to uh, the use of AAC in daily communication. And as such, whether the study really does address that risk that you pointed to, that some people point out uh, of AAC as, as being risky uh, because it might impede the, the actual language recovery. And so what's the question? Well, the question is, um, is it still not the case that AAC can still be risky for language recovery? <laughs> um, I think if you put it in front of them and you, you only teach them to use it when they have a problem and you're not encouraging them to attempt to try to say it. And so what I'm suggesting is that we have to kind of rethink how we teach them to use it. Yeah. So I think anytime you replace something and you're not simulating the part of the brain that, re that you need for spoken language, sure, there's that risk. Same as a physical therapist giving someone a wheelchair or a quad cane or any sort of support. We don't worry about that, right? We don't worry about that. And so that's, that's also my point, my, like my counter response is that we need to be less worried about that and more worried about how we're framing our interventions to help people use it more appropriately to facilitate plasticity. I think that's a clear point you made in your, in your talk as well, the need for, 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 for training both of the clinicians and, uh, and, the, and the users, right? We have a question from Tamara Atanasio. Uh, These studies make me really excited and you've inspired me. Do you have ideas on getting clients on board when they are resistant to trying AAC? That's a tough one. Um, and that's part of why I started doing this work because when I worked in the schools, I started in the schools years ago, um, the parents, you know, I want my kid to talk, you know, kid with CP, I want my kid to talk, kid with autism, I want my kid to talk. And then after I moved to rehab and I, mom just wants to talk. We don't want that device. We don't want that device. And that was what promote, prompted this, me to go back and get my PhD and do this work because we need data. So I think hopefully my data can help you convince them to say there's something here and you explain to them. And I try to teach my students in the aphasia class or if they're with me in the lab that explain your rationale. We have people when they come in for this study, you know, doing the consenting, they'll say, explain to me why you think this works. And I give, you know, a, a, a user-friendly version of the 
explanation I offered here. And then they say, oh, okay, like they're a little more willing to consider it. And um, I just think data is what we need and we're starting to get that data. And I'm hoping that more data, more people start to give us data in this area. So that it's not, you know, just a couple of people doing AAC. Um, I had another question, uh, whether, and I know you, you, you did talk about it a little bit, uh, can you talk a little bit more about specific AAC approaches to, to target different language modalities and, um, and, and perhaps the quantitative or, and or qualitative impairment thresholds for their use, right? So when to, when to start using those for which for for different uh, for speakers with different types of impairments other than aphasia no no i mean different types of aphasia i didn't want to limit okay. I, I didn't want to talk about the basically the different syndromes but rather the different language modalities that can be affected do you have ideas for what types of aacs to use for which types of deficits so not focusing on spoken language is that what you're saying like written expression well, people can have very different different issues with spoken language, right? So let's say anomia versus agrammatism or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think this addresses both. Um, you know, if if you're looking at what the the device looks like, if I can get it. You know, you've got and what we put in the text boxes here, it can be as simple or as complex as you want. So if you're working, if you want to pair it with a syntactic treatment, you can certainly do that. And you can put certain, you know, syntactic forms here that you're targeting, but then you teach them how to use it so that they can still communicate when their language fails them because it will, um, but you can at least start to reinforce certain syntactic structures that you're targeting. But it's also just, by nature going to address anomia and the types of cues we give people, you know, depends on what people are, are needing. Maybe you could add a semantic feature analysis treatment to this to help them. And then you can have those words pulled from your stories using that in your SFA chart or something like that. Right. Um, so I think it's got a lot of um, flexibility in that regard. Yeah. So the main architecture is it, architecture is the same, but the contents can be different, right? That's Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Tamara Atanasio also asks, do you have app suggestions? No, <laughs> um, I can't keep up. I do have a student though. I can share a link. Um, I have a second year master student who's just amazing. She created an AAC feature matching tool for people with aphasia. There's literally dozens of apps in there. And she borrowed the feature matching tool from Boston Children's Hospital that they used um, to feature match devices to people with ALS or people with CP with severe physical involvement. But she adapted it to work for people with aphasia. So I can send that to you, Dirk, if you, um, you can send it out to the group. I can um, and she's got, her roommate's fiance is a computer programmer, and so he got this Excel file to work. So you type in certain things and it spits out apps for you. Um, but it's so hard to keep up with the technology. But her goal is to, she told me I have to keep getting a senior capstone student to update that feature matching tool so that we have it. So I can send that to you to send out to people. Yes, I can do that. Thank you. We have another question coming up. I've just asked the the question asker to expand a little bit because so maybe that's coming in. So the question was uh, from Elizabeth Hansen, fantastic presentation. Will you reflect on your experience with constraint in induced language therapy research as you think about these studies? Yes, and actually the, what, what prompted me to do this is my, my mentor, um, Dr. Jerzy Lavarsky, who's a neurologist, um, you know, he brought me on to help him with this, the constraint-induced studies, and he he knew that I was doing this AAC work, and he basically said, "Oh, that does that that's not going to make anyone better." And so basically, I I wrote a training grant on a dare, because the last thing someone needs to do is tell me that I can't do something. So he told me that it wasn't possible, and so because of him, you know, I've been able to come this route. So I think on I think on that all the time, and I hope that I 
kind of explained how the two worlds kind of came together. I finally understood why people were fearing this from a neuro, like a neuroplasticity perspective. Um, so it, it guides me all the time. So I don't know if I answered the question or not, but. I think so. I, I'm not seeing a, another response, so okay, be good. Yes, Elizabeth Hansen says. Okay, so, <laughs> thanks, okay. Liz. That brings us. That's the end of our uh, of the questions on the chat, Amy. Thank you very. Th thank you so much for ending our season uh, on a positive note, uh, talking about AAC. Um, and for the rest of our audience, uh, we hope to see you back at the end of August for the kickoff with Alex Basilakos and Sigfus Christensen. Um, and for now, so, and Amy, if you send me uh, the other, other materials that you promised, then I will forward those to the C-Star mailing list. Okay. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.